and work your magic. Um, and if you want any Q and A, but you need to unmute yourself, Eamon, please. I'm in as plus I'm sharing with Anne to show the footage, so I, I presume that's all set up. Um, lovely to be here, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much indeed for the invitation uh, to um, uh, Pauline. And um, this morning we're going to talk about the partition of Ireland. It's the big event we're looking forward to the centenary of it to mark it in various ways in the coming year. But it is the decisive event in the history of this island. And we still live with the consequences of the events of 1920 to 1922. Um, now, of course, uh, just by way of introduction, if you were standing on the streets of Enniskillen, say, or Paligali or uh, Oma in 1910, and someone said to you that Ireland would be divided in 10 years' time. That will be a great war in which 12 million people might die, including 50,000 from this island, from both traditions. There would be a rebellion in Dublin, which would change the course of Irish history. That Ireland would not get the much promised Home Rule Bill, except in the north. That Ireland would be divided amidst violence in 1922, and two Irish states would emerge um, with civil war raging in the south within 10 years. They would have taken a deep breath and said, no, 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 this is never going to happen because from the Union of 1801, Ireland had been governed from Westminster. And of course, it was part of the United Kingdom and it was governed really um, as par under the British Crown uh, from Dublin Castle. It was the nerve centre of British rule. The police were sent from Dublin, the Royal Irish Constabulary to all counties. Um, the court system with the various circuits cross county borders. Um, teachers were trained in Dublin. The churches are their headquarters, generally in Dublin. The Orange Order had its headquarters in Dublin. And people were used going up to Dublin, regardless of politics, um, where they saw Union Jacks fly. So the idea that somehow Ireland would be transformed, transmogrified within a decade of 1910 would have surprised the average Fermanagh or Tyrone man, since we're talking essentially to a Fermanagh Tyrone audience this morning. But of course, all of this was to ensue. And if we see some of the footage, maybe Anne, just bringing us back to that early period just to set the scene, because of course, the home rule question had been boiling since the 1870s, 1880s. Parnell in particular had demanded home rule for Ireland, and he had persuaded Mr. Gladstone, the Liberal leader, to bring in the Home Rule Bill. But by 1912-14, Ireland was on the brink of civil war, and we're about to see some warships dispatched to Belfast Lock by the Liberal government of Herbert Asquith, in 1914, uh, in response to the resistance being pledged by um, Edward Carson and the Ulster Unionists. And here we have this piece of gunboat diplomacy, I suppose we would call it, when a weak Liberal government, dependent on Irish nationalist votes, responded to the arming of the UVF by sending these formidable uh, dreadnoughts. But of course, the reason they did it was because, just pausing it there for a moment, and um, a Dublin lawyer called Edward Carson had offered his services to the Unionists of the North of Ireland in 1910. Dublin, uh, Carson was a quintessential Southern Unionist. His roots lay in the mercantile classes of Dublin, among the Church of Ireland, and indeed the landed gentry of County Galway, because it was from his mother, um, Isabella Lambert, of Cromwellian planted stock at Athen Rye in County Galway, that Carson got his worldview, support for the Union, support for the Empire, and of course, insistence on what he called in a letter to his political friend, Lady Londonderry of County Down, as our own splendid folk. Our own splendid folk were the Anglo-Irish gentry educated in the Irish Midlands and at Trinity College. He became a lawyer, one of the finest barristers of its day. He became MP for his old university, Trinity College. He was essentially a Southern Unionist. But by 1910-1912, he was leading the Ulstermen, the Irish Unionist group. His lieutenant being James Craig, a very different man, his finger very much on the orange pulse of the North, the son of a wealthy distiller, a leading orange man, and a man who wanted a homeland for his own Protestant people in Ulster in the event of an Irish parliament in Dublin. For Craig, for so many others, home rule was room rule. Home rule would devastate the economy 
of Belfast based on linen, shipbuilding and engineering. This is Belfast's boom time, Ireland's only industrial city, hardwired to the empire. And I think Alan's going to show us some of the UVF gun running at Dramalis. I think maybe that's the, 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 the text coming up. But just reminding us, yes, indeed, machine guns ready. This is Sir Edward Carson, former Solicitor General, a future Attorney General, a man who upheld the law, who loved the law, who became a law lord in his last years. But this is Carson who authorised the illegal importation of guns from Germany into um, Ulster in 1914. And of course, the UVF, the force which he can run that at any time, and the UVF, the force which he had raised with James Craig in the shipyards, in the Orange Hall, had been drilling from 1913 the first citizen army really since the 18th century on the island of Ireland. They would have no home rule and now they had 35,000 German rifles and machine guns with three million rounds of ammunition. Um, ran into the port of Larne and uh, this is Carson reviewing the Ulster volunteers at that time. Um, upper strong. class, middle class, working class, they were to inspire of course a revolution in Irish nationalism because within 10 months the Irish Republican Brotherhood had spirited into existence a rival army, the Irish Volunteers, who were there to defend Ireland's rights to defend Home Rule, founded by another, uh, by an Ulsterman, Owen McNeill. But of course, and of course, the warships were the response to the UVF, which we saw there um, in 1914. So it's in this period, really, that the question of partition first emerged. We have to be aware of this early, earlier kind of um, raising of the issue. Um, there was talk about county option, allowing particular Ulster counties, those with a unionist majority, a Protestant majority, nobody questioned the kind of um, overlap between religion and politics in those days, that these counties like Antrim, Down, Armagh, um, Londonderry would be allowed to ele elect out of an Irish parliament for a period of years. The Liberal government were relying on the votes of 80 Irish nationalists, led by John Redmond, a very moderate nationalist leader, a British imperialist, a man whose mission was to reconcile North and South and Britain and Ireland. Of course, by 1918, he would fail and he would die in a final effort at reconciliation. Nonetheless, Redmond refused to accept any thought of partition. It was, he said, an abomination and a blasphemy. Had he engaged with partition earlier, he would undoubtedly have achieved a 28 county, a 28 and a half county Irish parliament. But because he opposed partition in principle, it came down in 1914 to Ulster being on the brink of civil war, these rival armies, the Irish volunteers, the Ulster volunteers, traversed the land. And of course, the UVF were much better armed. Um, and uh, they, of course, were under Carson's leadership, prepared to fight the British army um, to oppose home rule. And again, uh, of course, what, what, what averts civil war? in 1914 is the outbreak of the Great War. And I think we're about to see the, the last march past of Carson's army, as they called it, the Ulster Volunteers, marching through Belfast, en route to the docks for final training in England. And then, of course, they will be transshipped to the battlefields of Europe. And a critical thing in Unionist history was the Battle of the Somme in July to November, that long, arduous, brutal battle, nearly a million casualties, but 5,000 UVF casualties on the first day. And of course, this was unionism, blood sacrifice, which would, of course, uh, parallel the nationalist blood sacrifice, Pierce and Connolly and Easter week. And we have to be aware that these all impacted on the situation. Just freezing it there for a second. Because in their campaign against Home Rule, Edward Carson had the support of the British Conservative Party. They were led helpfully from Carson's point of view at this time by Andrew Bonal Law. But he was the nearest thing to a Ulster Unionist Prime Minister of Great Britain we ever had. His father was a clergyman from Coleraine. He'd been brought up in Canada in Glasgow. And his heart beat in unison with the Ulster Unionists when they said home rule was home rule, when the Conservative backbenchers said that home rule would endanger the empire from Canada to Africa. He believed them. And from the 1880s, um, Ireland had become the touchstone of British politics for the Conservatives and the Liberals as the Tories changed their name to the Unionist Party. 
to prioritize any, all opposition to home rule for the island of Ireland. So they had this extreme policy. No home rule for Ireland, when the majority of Irish people were demanding home rule in election after election, but also they pledged their um, support to Carson and the UVF. There are no limits to which Britain will not go to support the Ulster Unionists, said Bono Law in Belfast in 1912. So you have this massive alliance between the Irish Unionist decision, essentially the Ulstermen led by Carson, and of course the Ulster Unionists. Of course, we have to say something else. Carson was a quintessential All Ireland Unionist. He was using Ulster as a weapon with its Protestant majority, not a very big one, 55%, with its industrial might in the Ligon and Ban Valleys, he was using Ulster as a weapon to derail the home rule train. He actually believed that John Redmond wouldn't accept home rule for a mutilated island, but there he was wrong, because the Irish nationalist demand for self-government would continue, regardless of partition. So in many ways, Carson was, this was a high-risk strategy, because what if he doesn't get um, the Union Jack for his own people, because his aim was to keep the whole of Ireland um, enclosed in the Union Jack. For James Craig, his deputy, the coming man, an Ulster Unionist, a shrewd man rather than an intelligent man, Craig knew what he wanted. He wanted a homeland outside home rule. And he was prepared to travel the same road as Carson, no home rule for Ireland, until they reached the crisis point. And of course, that point would be re would be reached really by 1916. And what we have then, of course, is the Easter Rising. I think Anne has some footage which she will show us of the Rising that you know transforms the whole Irish question. Um, they used to say that every time the British tried to solve the question, the Irish changed the question. In the last few years, we've seen every time we thought we'd solved the question, the British changed the question. But here we have the Easter Rising, some original footage that bolt from the blue. Um, you know, a thousand Irish rebels masterminded by the IRB, the secret Irish Republican Brotherhood, seized Dublin for a week. One of their leaders, Sean McDermott, said, We'll hold Dublin for a week and say to Ireland. It was planned as a successful national revolt, here being suppressed by the British troops led by General Sir John Maxwell. But of course, the revolt in the rest of Ireland collapsed. Um, the volunteers were sent home. It was only in Dublin real fighting took place, um, essentially. And the result was, of course, the court martials, the executions, the blood sacrifice. What one uh, Anglo-Irish aristocrat was saying, blood flowing from under a cl closed door. That's what Lady Fingal said. In other words, it transformed nationalist attitudes from support for moderate home rule to support for an independent Ireland, an Irish Republic. And from the ruins of Sackville Street, now in the picture, those beautiful Georgian buildings led west in the second city of the British Empire, a phoenix arose, not myself, I have to say, but a new movement called Sinn Féin, which would sweep the polls in Nationalist Ireland in 1918, demanding an Irish Republic. And of course, so much happens, if you just freeze it there, that sort of soldier betokening the new dispensation. The Great War continued. Irish men on both sides died on the Western Front. But the psalm which we have seen was a tremendous, um, if you like, iconic event for us to unionism. We maybe have one of their leaders at the time, um, Sir Norman Strong from County Armagh, describing the advance at the psalm. I think we have to really grasp this to understand um, the unionist determination from 1912 onwards, but especially after the rising in Dublin to um, ensure self-determination for the Protestant North. Here's Sir Norman Strong, who was, as you know, tragically murdered in 1981. And here he is talking about the Ulster Division and his men. I think we'll hear him now, I hope. Um, perhaps he's talking about his involvement in the Somme, about the heavy losses that they encountered, trying to take the Schwaben Redux. I'm afraid in the morning. And Colonel Ricardo came along about, um, I suppose, three o'clock in the morning. And he said to my colonel, he said, I'm afraid that the people on our right will not succeed. And my colonel said, why? Well, he said, they've had an awful hammering. 
He'd been in the line some time and had got an awful hammering. And he said, I don't think, I'm afraid that it will be a failure on our right. Well, it was actually. They didn't get out. I don't know whether the bombardment on their flank was worse than ours because the result was that we attacked and went right through the German front line and support line too and captured the Sweden Redoubt. And that Sweden Redoubt was not captured again till, oh, I think, the end of the year, if it was the end of the year, several months before it was taken. It was a very, very strong position. And Just stop there, and So we have a good, we have a sense here of this landlord from the Armagh Monaghan to Rhone border who would die tragically many years later. He survived the rigors of the First World War and died in his own home during the IRA campaign. And we have a sense here, of course, of Sir Basil Brooke, the Fermanagh landlord who served in the, the First World War. And the song was a major iconic thing. Shortly afterwards, Carson made a speech in Belfast in which he said Home Rule was killed and was buried on the battlefield of the Somme. So in many ways, the Unionists are demanding, if you like, reciprocation from the British government uh, in terms of safeguarding them from nationalist rule in Ireland with even more vehemence after the Battle of the Somme. So we have the rise of Sinn Féin after the rising, the 1918 election when Sinn Féin win three quarters of the Irish seats on a Republican platform, an abstentionist platform, and the established Dáil Éirinde in Dublin, uh, uh, the Parliament of an Irish Republic, which they proclaim with their own government, um, with Eamon de Valera as uh, president or Prevara from the Irish First Minister. And we'll maybe see some footage of the first doyle, which reminds us of these tremendous events running up towards partition in 1919, um, 1920. Um, and of course, the first doyle is a very historic. Uh, event uh, founded on the 21st of January 1919. Um, it's not suppressed for about 10 months because you have this shift in the balance of power in Ireland and in Britain from the old Home Rule Party virtually wiped out to Sinn Féin in Ireland, a Republican Party. And in Britain, of course, you have a shift from the old alliance of um, the Home Rule Nationalists and the Liberal government. Now you have a Tory dominated coalition in Britain headed by Lloyd George, who's a Liberal, but the Tories have enough members to overthrow the government anytime they want. This is the Doyle meeting at the Mansion House. Um, and of course, by April 19, it, uh, April 1919, the whole Doyle is there. A cabinet is declared with De Valera, Michael Collins, um, Carl Brewer, others are ministers, and of course, the IRA. The volunteers of 1916 expanded and retrained, become the armed wing of Doyle Aaron. And on the same day as the Doyle meets, the first shots are fired in what becomes an escalating Irish war of independence. We'll see here the first shots were fired at a crossroads in County Tipperary. This is the Doyle again, sending uh, de Valera escapes from jail. And here is Dan Breen, one of the IRA assailants. Uh, assassins at Solahead Beg, where they actually um, ambush two policemen escorting a load of jelly night. The policemen are shot dead. By the end of the year, 18 policemen are shot dead. 1920 becomes the turning year. It's the 1972 in Northern Ireland, in the whole of Ireland at that time, with all the vast tragedies and events, the British government's reprisal policy, a bloody Sunday, and of course we'll see shortly um, violence in the north. So violence is escalating. And it's against this background, really, that partition begins to happen. Because at the end of 1919, the British government set up a committee called the Long Committee at Westminster. We'll maybe just freeze it there. We're getting a sense of the highlights of the War of Independence, and thank you. And the result is, of course, that um, um, this committee is set up to consider the question of Irish Home Rule very quickly. It recommends the partition of Ireland, but not the partition as we have it today. It recommends a nine county Northern Ireland. The Liberals and the committee feel that this is more easily justified and a nine county Ulster will lead more quickly to a reunited Ireland um, uh, within the British Empire, which was with Britain's aim. Um, the Conservatives have their reservations about this in the committee. People like Lord Balfour, a former Prime Minister, close to James Craig, is aware there are concerns. The Unionists have done very well in the North in the 1918 election. Ireland is still undivided, but the Unionists had now 23 seats. 
They now had 10 seats in Belfast because the number of urban seats have been increased across the UK. So they have a much more uh, viable number of MPs and they're part of the coalition benches. Indeed, the pledge of Lloyd George and Bono Law um, to uh, safeguard the six counties of North East Ulster from uh, nationalist rule meant that Craig and two others became junior ministers in the Lord George government. Can you imagine it? Something that even Geoffrey Donaldson didn't achieve uh, two or three years ago with Theresa May. They actually got junior ministries. And so it meant that James Craig, for example, as, um, uh, perm uh, as Secretary of State at the Ministry of Pensions, was sure-footed in the corridors of power. He had access to cabinet meetings. He had the Prime Minister's ear. He could eavesdrop on committee meetings. And he made it very clear on the... Um, uh, 19th of November 1920, uh, that he did not want nine counties. Um, his words are very clear, recorded in the minutes of the Long Committee, which was chaired by Sir Walter Long, uh, a, a Conservative MP, hence the name. And this is what Craig actually said. He said, um, first of all, Fisher, the Education Minister, informed the committee 13th of November 1919 that at the Prime Minister's request, he saw Sir James Craig. Interesting, Lloyd George thought, thought it was necessary to consult James Craig about the future of Ireland. Craig expressed himself against the inclusion of the whole of Ulster in the Northern Parliament. I'm quoting the minutes and thought six counties preferable. So Craig didn't want nine counties with a very small and uncertain unionist majority of about 54, 55%. The reason given was that, and he quotes Craig directly to the committee, Protestant representation would be strengthened. And Craig also thought that six counties would be a unit easier to govern than the whole province. So here we have really evidence of a sectarian headcount. Carson said the unionist leaders went into the matter almost townland by townland and parish by parish. And this was a hard blow to many unionists in the nine counties. What about the Lagan district of East Donegal? Overwhelmingly Protestant farmland on the outskirts of Derry stroke London Derry. What about the unionists of North Monaghan, uh, Castle Saunderson and County Cavan, who had been part of Carson's army and had signed the Covenant of 1912? So Craig is being very, very pragmatic. The committee, though, still insisted on nine counties. They felt, no, Britain's interest required a larger Catholic minority. And this might lead to a coming together of some sort under the new Northern Parliament. A Parliament was decreed for the South, the Parliament of Southern Ireland, but nobody expected it to work because Sinn Féin would use the elections to elect the new Doyle and renew the Republican mandate. Um, and that's exactly what happened. So as somebody said about the Government of Ireland Act, and the, the um, if you like, uh, discussions in the Long Committee, they were very Ulster-centric. It was about safeguarding the Protestant North, whose representatives were part of this government. And it was about the Conservatives who led this government, headed by Lord George, um, if you like, um, honouring their pledges to the Protestant uh, majority in the North. That's what this was really about. But for Joe Devlin, the nationalist leader, um, this came, of course, as a bitter blow. He, with Redmond, had opposed partition and then by 1916 had accepted what he believed was the temporary partition of six counties, a scheme that collapsed. This is what Devlin wrote to a friend, Bishop O'Donnell, later Cardinal O'Donnell of Raffaux, on the 13th of February 1920. He's one of the few nationalists in the House of Commons. There were only seven of them out of a house of 700. And he's outside the loop. He's hearing gossip and bits and pieces. As far as I can see the situation, he told Bishop O'Donnell, it means a parliament would be set up here for the north of Ireland and not for the whole of Ulster, but for the six counties. Um, this will mean the worst form of partition and, of course, permanent partition. Once they, he means the Ulster Unionists, have got their own parliament with all the machinery of government, he means the police, the law courts, the civil service. I'm afraid that anything like subsequent union in Ireland will be impossible. Uh, we Catholics and nationalists could not consent to be placed under the domination of a parliament so skillfully established as to make it impossible for us to be ever other than a permanent minority. Now, Devlin attacked this. It meant permanent partition with a, a, a large, uh, definite unionist majority. 
um, a commanding majority, but it also meant, of course, permanent minority status for Northern Catholics in the six counties. And you can see in those two um, documents, Craig's response to nine counties squashing it in favour of six counties, which are easier to govern, where Protestant representation, representation will be strengthened, and Joe Devlin saying, this is the this is a Dantean vision of hell for the nationalist population of the six counties. That's the way it's shaping up. Southern Unionists, of course, who were Carson's own people, were not keen on partition. Lord Dessart, a leading landlord in County Kilkenny, wrote to the Long Committee, Southern Unionists are all opposed to partition. Um, others, like myself, regard the Ulster attitude as selfish and a betrayal of their old friends in the South. And they saw Carson, as did border unionists in Monaghan and Cavan and so on, as very much a traitor to the all-Ireland unionist cause. Here was a Southern unionist for 30 years, an MP for a Southern unionist seat, who had moved north in 1918 to Belfast, Duncairn, and who seemed to have abandoned his own people. And Carson felt this very heavily, this accusation of betrayal from the Protestants of Galway and Clare and Dublin in the years ahead. And he would, he would during the treaty discussions, indeed the discussions on the Treaty of the House of Lords, Carson, who had just become a member, said, what a fool I was. I was only a puppet, and so was Ulster, and so was Ireland, and the game that was to bring the Conservative Party back to power. There was a bitterness there, as he turned in old friends like Bono Law, and Birkenhead, and Churchill, whom he felt had, had, if you like, given most of Ireland, his Ireland, if you like, virtual independence, um, uh, shaking what he saw as the blood-soaked hand of Michael Collins and Downing Street in 1921. So we're looking ahead there, but we, we have a strong sense of this. So partition was becoming a fact. And from that moment on, a series of appointed days were arranged for the establishment of a separate um, uh, administrative and policing authority in Northeast Ulster in the six counties. And we can see that happening. But of course, the war of independence was escalating. IRA actions were spread into the north. We may have a piece of footage here showing us uh, an event in Cork, the murder of the Lord Mayor of Cork, which was to have a bloody impact um, in Northeast Ulster in these last months before the partition of Ireland. Dublin Council still in charge. The Lord Mayor of Cork, Thomas McCurtain, just squeezing in there for a second. There are many incidents we could pick out, but this man is murdered in his own home in Cork City. He's not only the Sinn Féin mayor of Cork, but he's also the leader of the Irish volunteer stroke IRA in Cork, a product of the Gaelic League, of the Gaelic Revival, very typical of individuals like Eamon de Valera, or the northern uh, Protestant Sinn Féiner Ernest Blythe, also a, a, a protégé of the Gaelic League, and of course, McCurtain was murdered in his home in Cork at 1.30 in the morning in March 1920. The coroner's inquest revealed evidence that he was murdered by a policeman. Evidence was found at the scene. A doctor's evidence was uh, compelling. And the coroner's um, verdict was uh, to condemn the murder and to name a number of individuals, including a district inspector in the RIC, as culpable for the murder. His name was District Inspector Ross Oswald Swansea. He was an Ulsterman, he was a Protestant, he was quietly moved to the Unionist town of Lisburn in the days after the murder of the Lord Mayor of Cork. But of course that was to lead to massive sectarian violence in Lisburn in the summer of 1920. Now we'll just freeze it there, we'll not go on to the Lisburn trouble yet, while well, I try to set the scene. Violence is spreading to the north. Um, and James Craig is concerned that as the war escalates, Britain is losing the propaganda war. Two reasons for that. The British government had authorised reprisals, like the murder of the Lord Mayor of Cork. He had been shot dead almost certainly in retaliation for the IRA killing of a policeman in the city. Um, you had the burning of Cork City Centre in uh, November 1920. You had the sack of the town of Balbriggan. Reprisals became the order of the day, north and south, carried out not just by the police, but by the new reinforcements. The ex-soldiers known as the Black and Tans. And of course, this leads to the condemnation of Lord George's policy by the Church of England bishops, the Liberal press, the Labour Party. They were the coming power in the House of Commons. 
by Joe Devlin, whose stentorian voice is heard when Lord George says he has murder by the throat. And of course, Irish America is outraged um, during this period when de Valera is spending a, a year and a half, really, in America, raising support for the Republican cause. So all of this is happening. And of course, the war has just ended. Men are returning from the fronts amidst the pandemic of the 1918 flu. And of course, many of them are badly mutilated or shell-shocked, are suffering from poison, gas poisoning. Many of them don't live very long from their, their injuries. Um, there is a slump, of course, after the war in shipbuilding and engineering. Um, there are economic pressures, but also sectarian pressures, because in this period in the north of Ireland, um, economic pressures, if you like, are very much underpinned sectarian tensions in the workplace. About 3,000 Catholics had been recruited to Harland and Wolf during the war, a small minority of the 25,000 workers, but many of the ex-soldiers, of course, found that their old jobs had gone. Tensions are rising. Something is going to spark violence as the Partition Act is going through Parliament. It's assured of its majority, um, and this happens very quickly. In July 1920, two things happened. Well, maybe let's just look at the events in, 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 in Derry at this time, because Derry is a foretaste of what's happening on the eve of partition, because Derry experiences a civil war in 1920. The reasons for this are varied. The IRA campaign is extending. The UVF are being reorganized under their former officers, many of whom were seasoned in the First World War. And of course, uh, PR has been introduced for Irish elections, and that helps the nationalists in Sinn Féin to win control of councils in the north. Just freezing it there, Anne, for a second. Because in January and June 1920, in the urban and rural elections, the nationalists gained control of Dairy Corporation, the old London Dairy Corporation, for the first time in history. You have a nationalist mayor, Hugh O'Doherty, and a totally anti-partitionist council. Now, for the unionists who had seen Derry as a citadel, um, if you like, um, if you like, uh, uh, um, marked by the blood of the apprentice boys in 1689, this was a massive body blow. There's also another problem there, and that most of the unionist businessmen and councillors lived across the foil in County Donegal in their summer houses in Moville and Greencastle, or in the Lagan in villages like St. Johnston and Rufo, a hugely Protestant area, which was very much part of the hinterland of Derry, which was the railway centre, the hospital centre, the administrative centre for much of County Donegal. So partition had caused problems for them as well. Um, and then, of course, um, the result of this change of power is the eruption of civil war in Derry. It says five killed. In the end, about 40 people were killed. Let's see it, Anne, in a very, very brutal civil war on the streets of the Maiden City. Eventually, troops are sent up from the Curra. Um, the murders are brutal and sectarian. People are asked their religion and shot dead immediately. Um, if uh, asked their names and shot dead immediately. Snipers sweep the streets. A gunboat becomes active in the foil, sweeping the streets. Um, the IRA... Um, engage the UVF, and these are conditions approximating to real warfare. And of course, in the South, a general is captured, the war is going on, the papers are peppered every day by massive, massive things. If we could talk about this period in particular, the violence, of course, is growing closer and closer to Belfast, which has always been a powder keg. Riots throughout the 19th century, segregated housing. Um, as Churchill said in this time, Belfast was an underworld with violent passions of its own. And of course, that summer, in June, uh, July 1920, violence explodes in Belfast. Just watching the agony of Belfast, it doesn't reveal the worst, but it shows us the upsurge of um, violence in Belfast for the first time really since 1886. Um, several events, several things explain this. One is, of course, the IRA assassination of uh, Lieutenant Colonel G.B. Smythe of Banbridge. He was a police commissioner in Cork. He's shot dead by the IRA. His funeral comes north. Tensions escalate in Belfast, Antrim and Don. Carson makes a speech at this time, of course, at the 12th field in which he says, we will tolerate no Sinn Féin and Ulster. And the result is 
and not stir to violence in the shipyard and the engineering firms when they reopen after the 12th holiday. Something like eight to 10,000 Catholics and hundreds of labor trade unionists are driven out of the shipyard, really at the point of weapons like axes and mallets, and many of them are thrown into the tide. Sectarian violence erupts in the city. Within days, 20 people are killed. York Street is a particularly bad street. As the Catholics are driven out, uh, Catholics and the IRA retaliate by, by attacking shipyard trams. If we just freeze it there, this is the co-op, which is now becoming part of the new University of Ulster's city centre campus in Belfast. And there's a military post there, you can see, uh, in 19, between 1920 and 1922. But just to give you an example, on the 31st of August 1920, shipyard trams were attacked with, uh, by crowds from adjoining nationalist areas at 7 a.m. A gunfire breaks out. The military arrive with armoured cars, they fire into the crowd, 10 people are killed. Many of them are very young people going to their job. This is Belfast's agony. Let it roll there a minute, Anne. We can see that it involves the IRA, the UVF, highly organised, well armed. Um, you have loyalist paramilitary organisations. You have, of course, the British Army and the RIC, which is beginning to wilt under the strain because, remember, it's a mainly Catholic force. Um, so partition is erupting just as the Government of Ireland Act is making its way towards the statute book um, in the summer and fall of 1920. Plenty of uh, ammo in Belfast, shipyard um, uh, confetti, as they call it, and you have these paving stones. And of course, you have the flow of refugees from Catholic Belfast, from Lisburn, where the assassination of uh, Oswald Swansea, the DI who had been named in Cork, um, as being implicated in the killing of the Lord Mayor, he's assassinated the IRA in Lisburn in August 1920 on the orders of Michael Collins. And the result is the so called Lisburn pogrom. Um, uh, Major General Fred Crawford, founder of the Ulster Special Constabulary, um, a leading figure in the UVF, visits Lisburn in August 1920. He described it as akin to a town that the Germans had sacked in Belgium, which he had seen during the First World War. And he talks about the gutted ruins of the parochial house, every Catholic business burnt out, and the pathetic flow of refugees over the mountains into Catholic West Belfast. Of course, Protestants have been uprooted in the border counties and further south, and they're making their way at this period into the north, especially for Manor, where um, has the, it has the highest number of southern-born um, citizens in the 1926 census, many of them fleeing uh, intimidation and violence in Cavan, Monaghan, Donegal, and indeed as far away as County Cork. And this is a familiar scene in Belfast, Derry, um, Eastern Ulster during this period. Something like 450 people die violently in Belfast alone between 1920 and 1922. Some of the crimes are horrific. Churchill said it was cannibalism except the perpetrators, a word we hear a lot, the perpetrators stopped short of actually devouring the flesh of their victims. Now we can't separate the high politics, the long committee, uh, nine counties or six, the powers to these parliaments for peace, order and good government. We can't separate that from what's happening on the ground. And of course, the complete polarization of Catholic and Protestant in the north of Ireland, um, the nationalist population totally opposed to partition, have been looking forward to home rule uh, for most of the previous 50 years. The unionist population fearful of home rule and believing that the sacrifice of the psalm demands, if you like, a gesture of solidarity from this Tory dominated government at Westminster, people ditching at the side of the road, having been burnt out of their homes in this period. Now, something else is happening. There's a great fear on the part of James Craig, uh, Dawson Bates, who had been secretary to the Ulster Unionist Council and in charge of the Ulster Volunteers, a great fear that Lord George would betray them, that he'd be forced to the conference table with Sinn Fein, and that the North will be coerced into a united Ireland. Perhaps they fear a United Irish Republic. And by the summer of 1920, Craig is very active, buttonholing Lloyd George and other politicians. In July 1920, Craig is pressurising the British government to transform the Ulster Volunteers into 
and Ulster Special Constabulary, uh, a kind of an auxiliary wing to the RIC. It's Churchill who actually clinches the argument. At a meeting of the British Cabinet on the 23rd of July 1920, Churchill, of course, who knew Ireland, had previously been a home ruler, who was still a liberal but about to become a Tory, whose father had been Lord Randall, who said, Ulster will fight. And Churchill said, why not arm the Protestants and allow the police and military to concentrate their efforts against the IRA in the South where most of the fighting was occurring? And this led, of course, to the phrase arming the Protestants. The issue was raised again by Craig in September. It's agreed with the government that the um, UVF can be transformed into a government paid, liveried, and armed force, the Ulster Special Constabulary. There'll be A specials who will be better educated and more, um, if you like, reliable men. You'll have part time B special shipyard workers, farm hands, and then you'll have the C specials who actually include many loyalist paramilitary gunmen at this stage who can be called out in emergency. By 1922, as partition begins to descend, there are 32,000 armed specials probably about 4,000 IRA men. The Unionist population is overwhelmingly armed. And this is, this, is, this doesn't even include the 35,000 rifles, which are in the um, police barracks in Belfast, going back to the law and gun running. Now, Craig insists on something else. Exactly 100 years ago this week, he insists on the appointment of an undersecretary who is not responsible to Dublin Castle, who's posted to Belfast with offices in the City Hall who will pave the way for the new Northern Ireland state. His name is Sir Ernest Clark. He's an experienced civil servant. He's seen as the midwife of the new Ulster state. Craig meets Clark in September 1920, and he said, if you're going to serve Unionist Ulster, the word Ulster must be graven on your heart. And Clark, who served in the Inland Revenue, he was very much a great figures, number crunching guy, who'd served in South Africa as well, he said, there's no room for Ulster because the words England and Empire are already graven on my heart. And Craig says, you'll do. And he's brought over. And of course, he's very much in the hands of the Ulster Unionist Council. And they tell him right away on their first meeting, they table a memo and say, the police authorities and the leading officials paving the way for a partition mustn't treat the two communities equally. This is to be a Unionist state. The leading police officers, the leading officials are to be unionists. In the House of Commons, Carson had said that nationalist officials should be um, dismissed from the civil service or transformed, or transferred. There must be, this must be a state with a loyal civil service and police force. So we have the birth really of a unionist state in the, in the memos, in the minutes, which we now have available under the 30 year rule uh, from the from the union. Now, of course, this is moving very rapidly towards the spring of 1920. By the early 1921, the spring of 1921, as we move into 1921, um, uh, Lloyd George realises he's lost the propaganda war. There's huge outrage in Britain at the name of Great Britain stinking in the nostrils of the world. If you think of some people are outraged at the moment about the threatened breach of international law at that stage the authorization of reprisals. And many of the victims, innocent people, of course, stinks in the nostrils of the Labour Party, of uh, Asquith and the Liberals, of the Church of England bishops, of the liberal press, of, uh, the, uh, of Irish America. All of this pressure is on Lord George. And he decides with Churchill at the beginning of 1921, as the war continues brutally in Ireland, that they really can't bring in hundreds of thousands of troops. That's not an option. Ball war methods will not work in the 20th century. They're going to have to seek a compromise. But before they will seek a settlement with Sinn Féin, it's necessary to tick that box of safeguarding Ulster and delivering their pledge to Craig and Carson going back 10 years. And this leads to elections, North and South, in May 1921. In the North, the Nationalists and Sinn Féin, they stand for election, but they boycott the Parliament. In the South, Sinn Féin has a landslide, so the Southern Parliament never emerges. But this is James Craig in his moment of glory, because the first Parliament meets in Assemblies College, the Presbyterian College in Botanic Avenue in Belfast. And this is Craig. He has not achieved really the homeland he set out to achieve in the bad old days of 
1910 and 1912. This just littered roll here. Um, uh, and then we'll see Craig, his cabinet ministers meeting on the steps of what's now Union Theological College. Um, Craig is still a minister in the British government, but he's prime minister designate. This is J.M. Andrews, the North Down um, linen magnate who becomes minister of labour and is a very hardline unionist in this period, uh, the architect of the Austria Unionist Labour Association. Um, this is H.M. Pollock, an elderly man, a liberal union. He had been in the Irish Convention in Dublin, grappling for a settlement to the problem in 1917. He's a floor miller. He's a close personal friend of Joe Devlin, actually, and would be on the liberal wing of unionism, would have been trying to win over, um, as, as, as Carson said, some of the best. Just freezing this man. This is perhaps the on palatable face of unionists for many nationalists. This is Richard Dawson Bates, previous organiser of the UVF. He's described by a, an inquiring British civil servant in 1922 as a weak man and a political hack. He regards all Catholics as nationalists and all nationalists as enemies, quoting the unionist historian Patrick Buckland. In fact, in 1934, as Minister of Home Affairs, in charge of policing the electoral system, really the architect of the abolition of PRR and gerrymandering, Bates discovers that a Catholic telephonist has been appointed to Stormont, and he actually refuses to use the telephone until she is dismissed, which duly happens. Um, and he's in charge of law and order. The British would have preferred somebody like the urbane and liberal Lord London Derry of Mount Stuart, uh, a man who wanted, if you like, to um, attract some Catholic support for the status quo. It might have been better if he had been in this vital sensitive position in charge of law and order. And just freezing it there, that's something we have to say. The powers allocated to this parliament, of course, while they seem minor, it couldn't declare war on Germany, uh, it couldn't negotiate a peace, it couldn't upset the monarchy, it couldn't raise taxation, but it was in charge of policing very sensitive area in Ireland. It was in charge of elections and the electoral system. Um, it was in charge of uh, education. Uh, it was in charge of labour. These were all sensitive areas in a divided society. And of course, in the six counties, uh, two thirds of the population concentrated mainly in the East were Unionists or Protestants, one third were Catholics or nationalists of one hue or another. And nobody questioned that. So Dennis Henry, the first Lord Chief Justice of, of Northern Ireland, who was a Catholic Unionist from Draperstown, um, stated in court in Omar, at an election court in 1918 that nobody doubted that every Catholic on the register was a nationalist or a Sinn Féinor, and every Protestant was a Unionist. Nobody questioned that. So it was the demand of Craig and his supporters that the police and the, the new civil service would not try to mediate between these two sections. This was to be a unionist state reliant on the loyalist population and not what's constantly referred to in these memos as the disloyalist population. Just moving on. Um, don't recognize I, I, this man, but somewhere in the mix is um, Sir Edward Archdale, the Fermanagh landowner of Castle Archdale, whose uh, father had been a home ruler, but who was a strong unionist. And here they are on the steps of the Assembly College. Now, of course, this parliament was being set up. The war continued, but something else happened. The king is brought over to Ireland in June 1921. Once this parliament's set up, Lord George, a liberal, a prime minister without a party by that stage because liberalism was uh, rent in twain, Lord George wanted to open negotiations with the Republicans, with de Valera and Michael Collins. He couldn't do that until Protestant Ulster was safeguarded. And so the king is invited to open the Northern Ireland Parliament in state on the 22nd of June, 1921. As the war continues, uh, the king arrives. We're going to see the king in a few moments progressing through the city. Belfast was in uproar. 60, 70 people were being killed every week, and that would continue until almost the end of 1922. I mean, this is the bloodshed for which no one really was ever charged. Um, the victims, families never really got justice. But the king was coming to Belfast, and we just freeze it there for a second, Dan. A lot of emphasis was put on the king's speech. He had to say something meaningful as an olive branch to the south. And here he arrives 
putting the seal and partition as the nationalist newspapers, the Ulster Herald and the Irish News put it, but here he's coming to Belfast with the Queen. She's very, very fearful because, of course, Belfast has a reputation for snipers and sectarian violence. And let's see this role, um, if we can. Um, um, and uh, just seeing the king arriving in Belfast, because this is the transformative act. The king makes a speech in Belfast City Hall, which is to called his grandiloquent speech. And as he addresses an exclusive, this is the royal yacht arriving in Belfast. It's the 22nd of June, 1921. Belfast is still a great shipbuilding centre. Ireland's only industrial city, the equivalent of the Royal Yacht Britannia, the King arriving, greeted on the shoreline by James Craig and members of his cabinet, the Queen, who was very, very nervous, Queen Mary, um, who had raised, you know, the Queen Mary guilds all over Ireland, had raised comforts for the troops during the First World War. The King, though, had always had an interest in reconciling Ireland and Britain and avoiding civil war. He called the Buckingham Palace Conference in 1914 to avert civil war, and now he's coming to Belfast City Hall. It's his speech there that day that changes everything. He called on Irishmen to forgive and forget. Now, there's a big one for you. We talk about a line over the past, but to forgive and forget, to stretch out the hand of forbearance and reconciliation and to seek for the land that they love, a new era of peace, contentment, and goodwill. He's not talking to Craig of the Unionists assembled there, as the Nationalists sullenly resentful abstain. He's talking to de Valera in the South. Within days, a truce has been arranged between the IRA and British forces, and de Valera is in London. But the border is there, and Churchill uses, we just look at that for a moment, this crude line 300 miles long between Loch Foyle and Carlingford Loch, cutting through villages and parishes. Nobody expected that in 1910. Nobody. Nobody rejoiced in it in border areas. They hoped it was not going to make any difference to their lives, a bit like Brexit. And there are parallels here a hundred years on. But of course, Churchill wrote in his diary, from that moment, Ulster's position was unassailable. It would be very hard to remove a parliament and a government and an Ulster special constabulary who are now massed on that border to ensure the momentum towards partition and self-determination for the North under the Union Jack. And of course, the South then enters the the peace conference, we may see footage of this coming up that summer. De Valera will go to London. He'll meet Lord George. Lord George will discuss an Irish free state, not a republic. Um, the South must remain within crown and empire. This undermines Sinn Féin's republican policy. The truce continues. Um, De Valera uh, goes to London. It's a great occasion. Um, what um, the figure that Lord George compares to a second-rate schoolmaster, um, you know, gives Lord George, as he'd given James Craig in, in the previous month, a lot of history, a little geography and some economics. Nothing wrong with that. That's what keeps me in business. Um, but he arrives in London uh, and, of course, the Unionist government is being established. The violence is, 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 is stopped in the South, but violence doesn't stop in the North. Belfast is still a cockpit of paramilitary and sectarian tensions during this period. Um, and as we move on, of course, we move towards the Treaty of 1921, for eventually a treaty is signed. And in those negotiations, Arthur Griffith and Michael Collins, de Valera doesn't go, that's arguably a mistake, but Collins and Griffith go to London, seeking a united Irish Republic. They get instead an Irish free state, including the whole island, but they fail to overturn partition. The North is included in the free state, Lord George and the King celebrating that victory um, on the 6th of December, 1921, after the treaty is signed. But of course, when the delegates come back, uh, the Doyle divides, de Valera rejects the treaty, uh, the Doyle narrowly accepts it, Michael Collins sets up a government, and we are into, if you like, um, the rundown to civil war in the South between the pro-treaty uh, IRA and the anti-treaty Republican IRA as we approach June 1921. In this period, of course, two things happened. Craig and Collins meet twice to try to achieve peace um, in the North, so uh, the, the, the Craig Collins Pact of 1922 talks about restoring nationalists to their jobs and homes. Peace is today declared, but it doesn't really succeed. 
because vast passions have been unleashed on all sides. Collins raises the, lifts the Belfast boycott, the boycott of Belfast goods, which had been brought in the Doyle in retaliation for sectarian attacks on nationalists. Uh, but the anti-treaty IRA, IRA undermined Collins's authority. And by the summer, we have the outbreak of the civil war in the South. Um, however, of course, violence erupts on the border, that new border. We're going to see some of this now in 1922 from the Formella to Rome area. People would recognize this because in the run up to the civil war, the IRA uh, uh, occupy part of County Fermanagh from a strong point in County Donegal. They use the Leak Fort, which is just inside Free State Territory in Donegal, to overview the village of Belik in County Fermanagh. And of course, the B specials are sent in across the lock. In those days, the main road from Enniskillen to um, Kesh uh, and then Belik ran through parts of County Donegal. Um, and of course, the specials arrived by boat. There is a standoff. In fact, there's a battle between the IRA and the specials. We're about to see all this because we'll see footage now of that fighting on the border, which could have resulted in an all Ireland civil war, a North South civil war, something that was always a possibility uh, in 1922. But of course, the specials, accompanied by Basil Brook, are sent in. Then the British Army are sent in. And Churchill orders the shelling of the IRA and Belik Fort. So this is the Battle of Belik in June 1922. These are forces entering County Donegal from the north to repel the IRA who had been making incursions across the border. This is shelling the village of um, um, this would be the shelling, actually, of Belik and Belik Fort in a sleepy little village famous for its pottery from the 18th century, as you probably know, um, which, of course, uh, was really part of the hinterland of South Donegal until partition. And here you have the British artillery. These men just left the Western Front um, a year or two earlier. And as you see, the generals and staff moving in, it's almost like a real battle. These guys are surveying, uh, you know, the Blue Stack Mountains as um, the British commander. And there's Basil Brook, just bringing him a bit closer. Oh, he's gone. But Basil Brook was seen there, uh, the future Prime Minister of Northern Ireland. In Mufti, you could see him. There he is. You see him with a hat. This is Sir Basil Brook um, of Coldbrook County Fermanagh, uh, one of the founders of the Ulster Specials. He had set up Fermanagh Vigilance in 1920 to repel IRA attacks from Cavan and Monaghan. Um, he became a minister in the Northern Ireland government in the 1930s, and he became prime minister. And he's kind of a military attaché as they move into Donegal. The British occupy Belief Fort. Um, they had shelled it. Seven IRA men are killed. The IRA uh, retreat. Lord George is getting worried about this battle because the British then take over Pettigo. Pettigo is an interesting village. Uh, we'll come to that in a moment. But Pettigo is an interesting village because the Donegal part was the Protestant part. Whereas the um, the Fermanagh part was the nationalist part, and the British stay there until 1926, giving false security to the Unionist population of Pettigo, who are then abandoned to their fate in the Free State. And we're about to see a remarkable um, woman in this conflict on the border. You've never heard of her, probably. Ulster's gallant woman ad admirable. This is Mrs. Edith Laverton, an Anglo-Irish. Uh, lady who had married actually um, into the Johnson family of Maharamina Castle outside Belik in County Fermanagh. And she's living in the Royal Hotel, is divorced from her husband, and she plays a part in the battles around Belik. Let's see this in action, and please. Mrs. Laverton, of course, her boat was the Pandora, and she takes. Um, a boatload of specials, and here she is using her telescope, she said, as a machine gun, inflicting, she said, heavy casualties in the IRA um, in um, the Belik area, uh, and she's known as the Lady of the Lake. I think they called the boat after her later on in this period. And we have remarkable footage of this aristocratic woman. She would later actually go south to Abbey Leaks and County Leaks, remarry, rear another uh, man's children, and never come to terms with Irish independence and the partition of Ireland. Now, of course, this wasn't the end of the border troubles. The Boundary Commission had been promised in the treaty. It would be set up in 1925. 
and it would it would examine the border, it would hold evidence, courts at Enniskillen, Oma and Derry, but in the end, it would leave the border where it was, but that's a story for another day. So the deep roots of partition from 1910, 1912, and people would have been amazed at the concept, to the bloodshed triggered by the Great War rising, and there, of course, of the partition of Ireland by 1922, and the establishment of two Irish states. Thank you very much. And Anne is showing us just the line at Belcou, the famous bridge at Belcou, as Free State troops and uh, B-Specials divide the bridge. They sit on either side of that line in the median point of that bridge, um, within sight of, I don't know if it's still there, the Border Diner. I used to work in Fermanagh. There was a place called the Border Diner in Belcou. You're more likely to go to Nevin Maguire's restaurant, of course, now in Black Line. But there we are. Thank you very much, Ian. That's another wonderful... Um historical talk for us today again and I, I just want to say a quick thank you to Shermaine I had technical difficulties here as I'm sure you found out my sound is completely gone on my computer and I tried to use a set of headphones it didn't work so I've had to go and put it um, get an iPad so thank you Shermaine for, for stepping in but Shermaine has been working on these um, shared history talks with us for a number of years now so well well fit for us and also Anne thank you very much as well for um, coming along today and sharing that wonderful film archive I think it really brings to life what you're talking about Eamon and it's wonderful to see those local examples like the Battle of Balik you know that's that's amazing um, I'm sure nobody else here would have seen that before you saw that footage and um, Shermaine and myself as well would be glad to see that there was a woman highlighted there Mrs Lamerton because we're often saying in history, women aren't really given um, much of a, a mention, but they were Just there. one, Pauline. Sorry? Just one. Just one. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, don't worry, Andy, the next course, the next work talk, you're in, be a woman. Plenty of women. <laughs> so anyway, I want to thank Eamon very much. And uh, if anybody now wants to ask a question, if they can just um, either uh, raise your hand or maybe with the big crowd maybe it's better just putting it into the chat function just to let me know that you want to ask Eamon a question and Eamon's happy enough to to take your questions thank you so is there anybody wants to start off maybe Andy we'll see you on the screen had you a question you wanted to ask Pauline I talked enough yesterday so <laughs> I, I, I hogged it yesterday I won't say anything today it was brilliant absolutely once again Eamon we just sit in wonderment with this man. Thank, Thank you very much. Do any of our participants there wish, wish to ask a question to him at all? 